So, um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about anesthesia considerations for a mother or fetus with a congenital heart disease. We're not going to have a lot of time for our, our fetus, but I, I do want to spend some, um, some quality time on a mother with congenital heart disease. Um, anesthesia for a mother with congenital heart disease can be incredibly challenging. The majority of congenital heart disease lesions are fixed in childhood, but some of these conditions of course, my daughter decides to call at this exact moment. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, um, so uh, uh, let me go back to the fact that, that these are very challenging um, patients to take care of from an anesthesia standpoint. A lot of these lesions are fixed in childhood, but a lot of these uh, patients, um, especially if they're coming from underdeveloped countries, may not have been diagnosed or treated, and many of these uh, initially get diagnosed with congenital, heart, with congenital heart disease when they're pregnant or when they actually present um, uh, on the labor deck. So this is the patient that you really don't want to see on a Sunday morning, um, but if you work at a high-risk uh, maternal hospital, this will be a mommy that you kind of see on a regular basis. This was a 24-year-old patient I had not too long ago who had had no prenatal care, very petite uh, mommy that walked in, uh, four foot eight, 44 kilograms, denied any past medical history, but had significant clubbing noted at, at her fingers. She presented with uh, fulminant heart failure and uh, fetal distress. And of course, anesthesia gets called because we need to optimize this patient quickly um, for C-section. Her room air stat was 78%, her respirations were 32. But she actually didn't appear to be in any kind of respiratory distress. Um, her heart rate was 140. So not the patient you want to see on a Sunday morning, but um, hopefully this lecture will give you a few tools to, uh, to be prepared for them. So the overall incidence of congenital heart disease has remained pretty stable over the last five decades. Um, we know the rate runs between 4 and 12 per 1,000 live births. But the prevalence of congenital heart disease in the adult population has increased um, over that same time period. And that's because we have been able to improve outcome and these, these uh, babies are surviving to adulthood and uh, becoming parents. So, um, you know, currently the, uh, the, the heart disease rate in pregnant patients runs between 0.1% and almost 4%. And again, that depends on your socioeconomic status of the, of the population that, that you are serving. Um, the most common type of heart disease that we see is rheumatic heart disease, and this topic, this subject is, is not something I'm going to touch on today. Uh, the most common one that we deal with is the right-sided lesions and your right-to-left congenital shunts. Um, you do see a lot of valve disease. You do see a lot of uh, vascular lesions. Um, as Dr. Bates has talked about earlier, there are definitely mommies that you would rather they not get pregnant. And those are your moms that have severe uh, mitral stenosis, severe aortic stenosis, dilated aortas, and par uh, primary pulmonary hypertension. These are very, very high-risk pregnancies. So it's critically important to understand the normal physiology and the changes of pregnancy because as uh, the cardiovascular changes associated with pregnancy and delivery progress, um, you're going to induce more stress in both the mother and the fetus. The central blood volume during a normal pregnancy increases progressively until about weeks uh, 28 to 32, where, we, where you'll see about a 45% increase in the central blood volume in, in a pregnant patient. And then as labor starts to get going and you get into the active and delivery and postpartum phases, you'll see a sharp up increase in stroke volume and cardiac output. Cardiac output almost doubles by the time you hit delivery in that immediate postpartum period. And these are the most um, critical areas, uh, times during, during the labor and delivery, because um, this is where a, a mommy who may have come in compensated will quickly become decompensated. So the anesthesia management really is dependent on the presenting illness or the state of, of you know, is she currently compensated or is she already decompensated? And I like to look at this in three broad buckets, you know, the, the shunts that are right to left shunts, the shunts that are left to right shunts, and then also your valvular and vascular lesions. So the first bucket is your left to right shunt. So these mommies are generally not too, uh, too sick. These are mommies that have uh, usually small ASDs, small VSDs, or small PDAs, and they may or may not have been diagnosed um, uh, prior to pregnancy.
and uh, they generally don't uh, come in cyanotic and they don't come, on, uh, come in in failure, although we can quickly put them into failure if we don't know what we're doing. The goals of care for the uh, left to right shunt is to um, prevent and to treat SVT type arrhythmias. They, uh, these right heart lesions are very prone uh, to SVT, so you want to make sure that they're, if they're not already on an agent, You've discussed uh, with cardiology what the uh, best agent would be for, for this patient. You want to avoid increases in heart rate. You want to avoid increases in SBR. You want to avoid uh, decreases in pulmonary vascular resistance. And then, of course, um, if they already have some evidence of pulmonary hypertension, you want to avoid further increases in pulmonary vascular resistance. We don't want to um, put them into right heart failure. The next broad bucket is your patients that have a left to right shunt. And these are typically your cyanotic lesions. And these are patients uh, with large PDAs. Uh, most of these patients, uh, by the time they present in labor, um, will usually have some degree of Eisenmonger syndrome. And then also, as the patient we discussed at the beginning of, of this session, um, the tetralogy of Fallot. It's very unusual for these patients to actually present uh, this late in pregnancy, but, but I've seen it on a, on a pretty regular basis over the last 20 years. So the goals of care when you have a right to left shunt is uh, number one, we have to maintain preload. You really have to watch blood loss and you have to avoid decreases in venous return. Um, you also want to be very careful with your SVR and your, and your pulmonary vascular resistance. You don't want to, you know, take this right to left shunt that's already be the cyanotic and then, you know, drop out your, your SVR and, and become even more cyanotic. So you really have to know your physiology and, and how to balance your right and left side. And these shunts uh, are very dependent on cardiac output, so you want to avoid any kind of medication that may uh, uh, decrease the myocardial contractility. And then the last bucket is your valvular and vascular lesions. You know, these are patients with coarctation of the aorta, aortic stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, the, the, the late effects of rheumatic heart disease, and then your uh, idiopathic hypertrophic subaortic stenosis patients. You know, the goals of care for these patients is, again, to avoid decreases in SVR, avoid decreases in heart rate, um, maintaining your stroke volume. A lot of these valvular lesions are very dependent on, on preload and stroke volume. And you want to avoid myocardial depressants. Again, they're, they're dependent on, on stroke volume and cardiac output. And the only caveat is that, you know, when you do have a patient with the idiopathic hypertrophic subaortic stenosis, a lot of these patients are already on some cardiac meds uh, controlling heart rate. But the last thing we want to do from an anesthesia standpoint is increase contractil contractility and then uh, increase that outflow obstruction, which then is going to not only compromise blood flow to the mom, but also to our baby. So maintaining physiologic balance is absolutely critical. You don't want to have a patient that is well compensated and then provide an anesthetic that quickly decompensates them. So it's very, uh, very important to understand the cardiac lesion that is presenting to you and whether or not you know, the patient is currently compensated or already started to decompensate. We have a lot of pharmacologic tools uh, that we can use to balance our, our right side and the left side of the heart as well as our volume status. Um, but sometimes it's the real low-tech stuff that works best, you know, avoiding hypercarbia, you know, using good old left uterine displacement, and uh, just some of the uh, basic vasopressors to uh, control uh, systemic vascular resistance. So just like with every pregnancy, there's a lot of potential problems that can occur at delivery. Uh, your mommies with congenital heart, heart disease are, are particularly prone to some of these complications more than uh, moms without congenital heart disease. Hemorrhage is something that you absolutely need to be very meticulous that you're monitoring. You know, a normal pregnancy, uh, 5 to 800 cc blood loss is not a big deal, but in a patient, um, you know, with a shunt, uh, dropping out that preload can be, uh, can be devastating. So, so keeping on top of your hemorrhage and, and compensating for it is, is critically important. Uh, pulmonary edema is also very common, especially as you get close to delivery and especially in that postpartum period. Again, this is because this is when the cardiac demand is the greatest. So being prepared to um, manage pulmonary edema in the, in the acute setting uh, is important. Uh, these patients are prone to dysrhythmias and tachycardias. And embolism is also uh, something that you have to be really, really vigilant with because uh, 
you know, we, we know that with uh, pediatric surgery, we're very conscientious about air. Um, but if you've got a mother with congenital heart disease, we need to be just as conscientious. And a lot of times uh, when you get into some of these um, transfusion uh, scenarios, uh, even, you know, 20, 30 cc's of air can have, uh, have devastating effects. So you need to really manage air uh, to prevent air embolism. And then the other thing in these patients, of course, is the fact that they, they're pregnant, so they're prone to VTEs, you know, thromboembolisms. And if they've got an intracardiac shunt, you know, that embolism, uh, that thrombus can be thrown into the arterial circulation, and that can have some devastating impact. And you need to be very vigilant in watching your mommies, making sure they're not having any neurological consequences and make sure they're not having any signs or symptoms, any kind of vascular compromise. Because, um, because of this risk, we want to be able to uh, do, uh, you know, uh, provide the correct intervention um, urgently if, if, if we do get a, an embolism. Uh, the acute pulmonary hypertension is another uh, uh, factor that happens in these mommies, again, because the cardiac demand can be so great postoperatively. So really monitoring them at their most, um, their highest risk phases is, is essential in avoiding um, accentuating any, any pulmonary hypertension. So the anesthetic management, you know, we now have some great non-invasive stroke volume monitors. Uh, used to be in the old days, almost everybody got an art line and a central line um, and was monitored in a maternal ICU type setting. But uh, nowadays, if we have a well-compensated uh, mommy with, uh, that's had real good prenatal care, we can avoid most of that. Um, but at the same time, if we do have a patient who's incredibly high risk and prone to uh, decompensation or already has signs of decompensation, we want to make sure that we are monitoring them uh, pretty aggressively. So these patients usually do wind up with an art line, usually do have a uh, central line, um, you know, not as many uh, pulmonary artery catheters as in the past, uh, because we are able to use uh, transthoracic um, echo at the bedside. And then in the operating room, we, we use a lot of TEE. So it's basically just balancing your right side and your left side, balancing your systemic vascular resistance and your pulmonary vascular resistance and being really vigilant with your fluid management. So there really is no best approach. You know, it's not as if uh, these mommies always have to have this type of anesthesia. It really is dependent on the presenting illness and, and the state of the cardiac compensation or decompensation. Generally, in a, in a mommy who presents, who's, who's well, uh, who's compensating well, Epidurals are safe. Um, epidurals do cause a, a significant sympathectomy, which means they, they, they can drop out their blood pressures after we start to load them up with the uh, local anesthetic. So we want to make sure that we're loading them very slow. We, we, I mean, some of these patients will take 45 minutes, even an hour, to, to get an adequate block as you carefully titrate the block and, and control their, um, you know, their blood pressure as you're doing it. Cesarean delivery, we usually avoid um, spinal anesthesia just because we don't want that sympathectomy to hit too fast. But epidurals can be used very safely. Uh, again, it's going to take longer to get to an adequate um, a level to be able to start surgery. If they're really high risk or showing any signs of decompensation, usually, um, you know, we're, we're, we're using general anesthesia for this mom so that we can use transesophageal echo and get real-time real imaging of the heart. So my last slide is, is basically looking at, um, you know, some pearls that we can take away on managing the delivery of an infant with congenital heart disease. This is its own entire lecture, uh, but since we don't have time today, I figured I would just leave you with a few pearls. And that is that it is really important that anesthesia is a part of that multidisciplinary team when this mommy comes in to deliver. Uh, there's a lot of things that we can do from the anesthesia standpoint to optimize uh, uterine blood flow. So the earlier we're part of that conversation, the better. We do want to optimize uh, the mom's hemodynamic status so that we can optimize uh, the, the, the blood flow to the baby. Uh, these babies do best if, if we can get them to full term, 39 to 40 weeks. So we usually are trying to, um, you know, keep mom uh, and, until we can get to a full term baby. Uh, these uh, neonates, um, as we all know, will require surgery usually earlier, and so the the, the more fetal maturity they have, the better weight, you know, the better their outcomes. And then the last pearl I'll leave you with is to talk to your surgeon, especially if you're doing a C-section around the umbilical cord and whether or not they're going to be planning on doing an autologous blood transfusion. 
a lot of times this is going to impact, you know, how soon we can give some medications. A lot of our medications, we're waiting until the cord is clamped. Um, and so if, if a baby is being born and, and we know that the surgeon is going to be milking the umbilical cord to, to, to provide an autologous blood transfusion at the time of delivery, we want to hold off on, on some of our, uh, our, our uh, oxytox, oxytonic medications or just the opposite. Sometimes they're, they're clamping the cord early and they want to be able to do a cord blood collection. So just communicating really well with your surgeon to make sure what the goals of care are. Um, is important in being able to optimize uh, the infant born with congenital heart disease. 